I wanted to ask Lee to be seated. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, that so many important people today, I just wanted to say welcome everybody. <clears throat> Thank you very much. It happened a few years ago in Visegrad. President Wałęsa was asked to whom we owe the fall of communism, who made it communist collapsed. And his answer was pretty funny because he said, you know, 50% the Pope, Jean Paul II, 30%, no, no, 35% me, <laughs> and maybe 15% Gorbachev. And then there was a journalist who, who asked him, Mr. President, what about President Reagan? You're definitely right. Mr. Gorbachev must move aside a little. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, there are people, they were fighting for freedom. And then they made it happen. We have to honor those people. And there are people, they, they are still fighting for freedom. And we have to support those people. This is what the Freedom Award is about. I'm very honored. I'm very proud. We really appreciate the Freedom Award is somehow connected with the city of Wrocław. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. As you know by now, I'm Fred Kemp, President and CEO of the Land Council. And Mayor Dudkevich, thank you so much uh, for your opening remarks and setting the tone uh, for this evening. Um, I uh, want to just say a couple of words about a hippopotamus. Um, uh, Ambassador Feinstein was too diplomatic to answer uh, Foreign Minister Sikorsky's reference to the U.S. as a hippopotamus. Um, and we are uh, nationally insulted by, by this. Uh, um, actually, I'm just joking, but um, let me just say uh, uh, this. I want to answer the hippopotamus reference um, uh, by capturing the essence of the Atlantic Council. Stay with me. Um, uh, first of all, uh, it's the Atlantic Council's purpose to drain the water out of the mud and create a very nice meadow in which, so the hippopotamus, as you know, for those that you weren't there, uh, F uh, Foreign Minister Sikorsky said to be an ally of the U.S. is like being a hippopotamus in the mud, and then when it turns on the side, you're crushed, and Poland would scream, and that would be policy. So I'm answering that right now. Uh, first of all, uh, I think he captured, in a way, the essence of this whole meeting, Brussels Global Forum, Freedom Awards, and the Atlantic Council, because our job is to turn the mud into a lush meadow of uh, democracy and human rights. Um, and, uh, and the United States doesn't really aspire to be a hippo turning around. Uh, uh, we're really trying to be more nimble, more wise, but no less impressive. And we realize in this meadow with this impressive, nimble, and wise beast uh, that it would not be nearly as inviting if it were not for Poland's role in the history of changing Europe uh, and widening democracy uh, and expanding Europe eastward. And to a large extent, we are also recognizing Europe's meaning for the free world. So not a hippopotamus in the mud, a nimble, wise beast on the meadow dancing around with Poland and our European allies. That's my image. 
Um, first, a couple of rules. Feel free to begin eating, though it may be against protocol in Poland. It, it, it very much works uh, here tonight. Uh, there'll also be a break at the half point of this evening for dinner when you can talk and engage with your table mates with less restraint. Uh, when we conclude the awards ceremony tonight, also please allow our staff to guide you to the terrace where we will have a very special uh, treat for you. The mayor says, I can't tell you what it will be, only that it will be enormously special and you can continue to engage in conversations with your fellow guests afterwards. I do want you to join me in a round of applause for one of the most dramatic uh, uh, demonstrations of uh, US-Polish cooperation and success, and that's the combination of the local team here in Wrocław and my Atlantic Council team. You've really done a terrific job. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just honored to welcome you to the fourth annual Freedom Awards dinner and the third in Wrocław. On behalf of the Atlantic Council, I want to uh, thank you for coming to this always important occasion when we honor uh, not only those courageous figures who battle for freedom, individual freedom, democratic freedom, economic freedom, religious freedom, but rather we also celebrate what we stand for uh, as the transatlantic world and friends which is ultimately a community of values. Some believe it was an unfortunate uh, distraction that uh, President Obama made his misstatement this week. I'm actually of another view. Whatever the cause of the misstatement, uh, I believe the misunderstandings of this week, the apparent insensitivity on one side the apparent perhaps oversensitivity on the other side show that we're not communicating well enough together, we're not understanding each other well enough together, and it demonstrates the usefulness of the Wrocław Global Forum and our Freedom Awards and has re reconfirmed us in our passion to go forward. We need to bring more Americans to this part of the world so that we remain engaged and educated in the new generation. And we have to bring Americans together with Central and East Europeans with their Polish neighbors uh, to reconfirm our, uh, our commitment to democracy uh, and, and, and progress in the world stage. Nothing could more dramatically remind Poles and Americans uh, uh, that we have a relationship that has helped change the history of Europe than the awards ceremony tonight, and we can continue to make common cause to help change history. But we dare not forget, in a misunderstanding like this week's, uh, that the underlying values and opportunities uh, uh, are the most important part of this. It's an interesting news story this week, but we as a community of influence, all of us here tonight, owe it to ourselves to say, what do we wish to make of it? I would suggest an even more pronounced U.S.-Polish commitment to the work of the Wrocław Global Forum and our annual Freedom Awards, which we put in Poland because we do know that Gdansk was a Polish shipyard. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, it's a privilege for us to host this dinner for the third time in the vibrant and charming city of Wrocław. Thank you and to your team for this three-time success. I also want to thank the U.S. Embassy and Ambassador Lee Feinstein, a dear friend, outstanding diplomat, and one of this evening's co-chairs, in many respects, one of the co-founders of this initiative. Thanks also to the other co-chair of this evening, Ambassador Robert Kupiecki, who could not join us tonight, but is a valuable supporter of the Atlantic Council. We work together with him very closely in Washington. Indeed, at this point, I'd like to have all board members and international board members of the Atlantic Council uh, who are here to stand as they are named, and then please hold your applause until I'm through with the list. President Alexander Kwasniewski, Dr. Jan, Dr. Jan Kulczyk, Anna Palacio, the former Spanish foreign minister. Ellen Tauscher, pre previous Congresswoman, Under Secretary of State Special Envoy. 
Svetan Vasilev, Chairman of the Supri Supervisory Board of Corporate Commercial Bank. Rick Burt, former ambassador to Germany. Bob Abernathy, California entrepreneur. Maciej Wojtutski, our only Polish board member. And Rafał Dutkiewicz, our great friend and one of our few lifetime honorary members honored last evening. Warm thanks must also go out to the Polish Foreign Ministry and Foreign Minister Radek Sikorski as well as our think tank partners in Poland, the Polish Institute for International Affairs, the Center for International Relations, and the Institute for Public Affairs. The Freedom Awards were inaugurated in 2009 on the 20th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. These awards are meant to honor exceptional individuals, organizations, and people that fight for freedom around the world. Tonight, we are recognizing key figures and institutions who have changed the course of history with their courageous defense of democracy and human rights. We do have several previous awardees in the room, and I ask them to stand as we name them. And by the way, we intend in future years to invite all the previous awardees here next year in Wrocław. Uh, please stand. Foreign Minister Radek Sikorski. President, President Alexander Kwasniewski, former Prime Minister, <laughs> former Prime Minister Jerzy Buzek. <laughs> Tonight we also have in our audience Natalia Kalidia of, of the Belarus Free Theater. <laughs> Natalia Kaliada could not be with us last year to accept her organization's award in person but we are thrilled that she has joined us tonight. Thank you, Natalia, for being here, and we, we wish you and your country the best. When we sat in this room la last year, we were in awe of the incredible transitions taking place in the Arab world. And today, we can look back at what has been achieved and know that, as Minister Sikorsky so aptly put it at last year's Wrocław Global Forum, quote, there is a democracy gene that all people have. Everyone has the fundamental desire to control their destiny. We just saw Egypt undergo its first democratic presidential election with record voter turnout. The Tunisian people, who we will honor tonight, participated in an election last October and now find themselves led by a president who has committed his life to advancing human rights and democratic values. We will honor him. But there is still work to be done, not only in the Middle East, where the people of Syria continue to suffer under a brutal and vile regime, but also here in Europe. Belarus remains repressed by Lukashenko's tyrannical leadership, leaving countless citizens deprived of their civil rights and freedom. Ukraine has taken an unhappy turn. We would like to lure Russia closer to Europe, but instead it distances itself. These unfortunate realities, and we must say them straight, and we must deal with them uh, here, remind us all of our responsibility to demand freedom for all the people around the world. The city of Wrocław and the Polish people know the importance of solidarity in times of turmoil and transformation. They know the risks that accompany a courageous stand against oppression. Tonight's honorees stand out for their fearless perseverance against tyranny and corruption. This evening, we will honor the people of Tunisia for boldly initiating a historic wave of change throughout North Africa and Middle East. President Monsef Marzouki, Tunisia's president, will accept the award on their behalf via video message. He has played a crucial role in guiding his country through its democratic transition. We are delighted to honor Emma Bonino, vice president of the Italian Senate and trustee of the Arab Democracy Foundation as an awardee this year. Never afraid to take a stand on delicate but important issues. She has been a trailblazer in defending civil liberties and one is one of the first supporters of democracy in the Arab world. We will also uh, honor Vladislav Bartoszewski, an Auschwitz survivor, former Minister of Foreign Affairs, and current chairman.
uh, an Auschwitz survivor, former Minister of Foreign Affairs, and current chairman of the Council for the Protection of the Memory for the Struggle of Martyrdom, who uh, will accept a Freedom Award for his incredible lifelong service, lifelong means 90 years, uh, to Polish freedom. A Freedom Award will also be presented to the National Endowment for Democracy represented represented by its president, Carl Gershman. The National Endowment for Democracy has tirelessly championed the growth of democracy by strengthening civil society in nearly every, every corner of the world. This work needs to be consistent. It needs to take place over years. They've been there all the way. You'll hear some remarkable stories from him and see photos tonight that I hope will appear in every Wrocław and Polish and perhaps other newspapers. And to conclude this evening, we will pay special tribute to Alice Bieletsky, Belarusian human rights defender, chairman of the Human Rights Center Vyazna, and the 2011 Atlantic Council Freedom Awardee. In August 2011, just two months after we honored him, Alice was arrested by Belarusian authorities and was sentenced to four and a half years in prison. We are saddened, but also honored, to highlight his struggle this evening with the help of a couple of very special guests, actor and director Andrzej Severin and Alice's wife, Natalia Pinchuk. <laughs> Each year, we are always proud to have such an impressive lineup of introducers to present the awards to our honorees, which also signals their support for this cause. This year is no different. Thank you again to President Alexander Kwasniewski, Foreign Minister Sikorsky, Prime Minister Buzek, and Atlantic Council Board Director Maciej Watutski as act, for acting as introducers for this special evening. It's a huge pleasure to see you all here tonight. And I'm thrilled we have been able to engage so many past Freedom Award honorees in this year's dinner. I expect that we will all leave here tonight with renewed resolve to support those standing up for freedom around the world let me now give the floor to my friend, Ambassador Lee Feinstein, one of this evening's distinguished co-chairs. Good evening, everyone, and uh, Mayor Dutkevich, Congratulations on another uh, spectacular uh, event here in Wrocław, making us feel all welcome and stimulating us to think about the importance of the transatlantic relationship. Panie Prezydencie, gratuluję. It's a great privilege to be the co-host of the Atlantic Council's Freedom Awards. These Freedom Awards were brought to Wrocław for uh, an obvious reason. Uh, they are here in Poland because of Poland's historical transition, perhaps the most successful transition of the second half of the 20th century. And it's magic that the Freedom Awards take place together with the Transatlantic Forum, the Freedom Awards, and the Wrocław Global Forum reinforce one another and remind us why we're all here together. The Freedom Awards recognize the effort of courageous individuals and institutions to channel and focus the universal desire for freedom into real world results. In practical terms, these efforts include not only inspiring other countries to reform, but actually sharing with them practical lessons we have learned about empowering civil society and building democratic institutions. Today, promoting democracy around the world is not a boutique item in our foreign policy. It's at the heart of our foreign policy. Poland was, in fact, the inspiration for many US and global democracy promotion efforts. In response to the Solidarity Movement's struggle, President Reagan called on the US Congress to establish 
the National Endowment for Democracy, which we honor tonight. In a speech to the British Parliament, President Reagan called for the creation of an institution to foster the infrastructure of democracy, the system of a free press, unions, political parties, universities, which allows a people to choose their own way, to develop their own culture, to reconcile their own differences through peaceful means. Today, Poland is at the heart of the transatlantic effort to promote democracy. And I'm proud to say that Poland and the United States are also close partners in promoting democracy. As Foreign Minister, Minister Sikorski said recently, the United States and Poland get on especially well whenever and wherever we decide to join forces and foster the ideals of freedom and democracy. And indeed, together, we have worked closely on promoting democracy around the globe, from Belarus to Benghazi. Last spring, the United States and Poland launched a US-Poland democracy dialogue, and now we have several joint initiatives, not only in the Eastern neighborhood, but also in North Africa and the Middle East. And we're very, very proud and honored, and we congratulate the Foreign Ministry for establishing the European Endowment for Democracy modeled on America's National Endowment for Democracy. Poland's leading role in the reinvigorated community of democracies, which was founded in Warsaw, in this country, by Professor uh, Bronisław Geremek and Secretary Albright, has ensured that this global platform for promoting democracy and freedom continues to give hope and voice to millions around the world. And Carl Gershman assures me that the community of democracies continues to be effective and is well on its way to playing an important role in the developments we're seeing around the world. These institutions and initiatives are only a few powerful examples of the role Poland has assumed as one of the premier advocates of democracy, human rights, and freedom around the world. When President Obama was here last May, he said in a joint press conference with Prime Minister Tusk that Poland brings special credibility and urgency to democracy promotion because of the success of its example and because of the, how recent its example was. And he was right. I'm therefore honored now to introduce a leader who has worked tirelessly to cement the transatlantic relationship and to strengthen the ties between the United States in Poland. In a country of many friends of the United States, there is none more steadfast than President Alexander Kwasniewski. You know the story. President Kwasniewski led Poland during a critical decade in its history. Thanks to his inspired and active leadership, Poland was the first in the group of Central and East European countries to join NATO. Five years later, he successfully chartered Poland's entry into the EU, and he remains committed to building a Europe whole and free. And as Fred said for these efforts, President Kwasniewski was awarded a Freedom Award in 2010. On President Kwasniewski's watch, Poland also continued its political and economic transformation, laying the groundwork for Poland's current economic strength and dynamism. As Polish president, he led by example. He was, as we say in the United States, a uniter, not a divider, always looking for common ground and ways to bring people together. I was just in Washington, and I just was talking to the president of Georgetown University, and we were talking about President Kwasniewski and his ability to inspire students. President Kwasniewski has been a vocal advocate for democratic reform and tolerance worldwide. You know about the role he played in Ukraine in 2004, and today he still champions those Ukrainians who seek a greater voice in their daily lives, and he talked about that today earlier during the Wrocław Global Forum. Today he is bringing the experiences of Poland's 
successful transition to North Africa and the Middle East. President Kwasniewski's support has given hope, know-how, and practical tools to democracy activists. In doing so, he helps to bring fledgling societies into the broader community of democracy, providing examples and models and giving people the confidence to believe that if Poland can do it, so can you. At the most recent meeting of the Community of Democracies, President Kwasniewski told his audience, no democracy can be an island. Democracy is not only something you believe in, but also something you do. You do it at home and you support it elsewhere. This is a duty, call it civic or moral duty. The French used to say, noblesse oblige, I say, démocratie oblige. Thank you, Mr. President, for your commitment to promoting democracy and freedom in Poland's neighborhood and beyond. Panie Prezydencie, the floor is yours. Ambassador Feinstein, thank you for that kind, splendid introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, dear friends, it is an honor to join you all here this evening to recognize such a remarkable group of honorees. I am particularly delighted to introduce our first awardee tonight, Tunisian President Monsef Marzouki, who is accepting a Freedom Award on behalf of the people of Tunisia. Of course, of course uh, presidents have very difficult schedules, particularly presidents of nations in transition. I know something about it. President Marzouki was not able to join us in person this evening. We will, however, be able to enjoy his remarks via video message. To the people of Tunisia, President Marzouki is far more than a head of state. He is personification of their brave fight for democracy, a fight that sparked a historic wave of change throughout North Africa and the Middle East. Because long before being elected president in December of 2011, President Marzouki was one of them, a physician who dedicated his life to human rights and political activism. An active organizer of many key human rights institutions in Tunisia, Marzouki faced constant harassment from the Ben Ali regime as his determination and courage threatened the government's corrupt rule. Yet, even after being arrested several times for his political dissidents, he did not shy away from standing up the Tunisian authorities. President Marzouki was forced into exile in 2002 after his political party, the Congress for the Republic, was banned by the regime. However, his exile to Paris did not impede his fight for a democratic Tunisia. He remained an unspoken critic of the autocratic government using social media to reach stay connected with other activists. Meanwhile, the citizens of Tunisia had had enough. One young man in particular, a bright young vegetable seller with a university degree, expressed his frustration by setting himself on fire as a final desperate attempt to exhibit his free will. Clearly, enough was enough. The citizens of Tunisia knew it was time to take a stand. They fearlessly united against the government and in early 2011 overthrew the Ben Ali regime. At such a fragile moment for Tunisia's stability, citizens needed a leader they could trust to put the country's well-being before his own interests. President Marzouki had dedicated his entire life to the achievement of this very moment, making him the perfect person to take on the daunting tasks. Perhaps 
the most impressive part of the Tunisian revolution, there are many, is the influence it has had on the rest of North Africa and the Middle East. Oppressed societies have witnessed Tunisia's incredible transition and now know that such a triumph is possible. This triumph of freedom over corruption, democracy over autocracy, would not have been possible without the bravery of the Tunisian people. They have proven to the world that citizens have the power to make their governments accountable for their citizens' human rights. This was an unprecedented accomplishment in the region and has beaten a path of revolution in countries where the world never thought it would see democracy. While the path remains bumpy, the past year has witnessed remarkable transition in North Africa and the Middle East. And the democratic electoral process is already being overwhelmingly embraced by citizens in Tunisia, Egypt and Libya. Tunisia's coalition government proves what can be achieved when political parties put citizens' needs first and they cooperate for the betterment of society. Recent Egyptian elections encouraged people to vote for the very first time in their lives, finally knowing that their vote would count. And in Libya, millions have already registered to vote in anticipation of an upcoming election. One of the other great victories of the Arab awakening has been the explosion of a flourishing civil society in a region where it had previously been forced into the margins of society, if it even exists at all. By working directly with these local organizations, the US and Europe can revitalize their development cooperation with the region. And while there have been so, so many triumphs, there is still much to be done. The challenge now is to ensure that these new democracies are supported by strong economies. The United States and Europe must rise to meet this challenge for the success of this remarkable transition will be lost. If the people who fought so bravely are denied the opportunity to participate in a growing economy and improve their education systems and infrastructures. Dear friends, that is why evenings such as these are so important. We must remember that this is only the beginning. The fight for freedom is a long and we cannot grow tired. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here. Let me now bring your attention to the screen for the important video from the Tunisian president, Monsef Marzouki. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Kahn, it gives me great pleasure today to convey to you on my own behalf and that of the Tunisian people my warmth, thanks, and sincere gratitude for offering me the 2012 Atlantic Council of Freedom Award. Your kind and generous gesture is but a resounding tribute to the unabated Tunisian people's struggle for freedom and to its endeavors to be emancipated from the throes of oppression and the failed attempts of a stifling aspiration to dignity, justice, and progress. As a human rights activist who once was persecuted and forced to exile for the defense of my ideas of freedom, dignity, and equity, I come to learn that the price to be paid for the materialization of this noble objective is certainly high, that the task, though painful and tenuous, is profoundly uplifting and rewarding. As you know, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, human rights advocates together with the resilient Tunisian people had suffered for decades from a dictatorial power, a corrupt economic system that relentlessly sought to annihilate their forces and dash their hopes for progress and prosperity. Yet because human mind cannot tolerate endlessly a state of unbearable oppression, because the aspiration to justice ran deep into the Tunisians' hearts, conditions were ripe to soak the flame of my country's revolt. Mohamed Bouazizi's last desperate act of self-immolation is but an indication that deprivation and the cry for dignity and emancipation cannot remain forever unheard. Today, Tunisia has just 
ushered into a new era where economic and political development as well as the renewed commitment to the core values of openness, tolerance and hard work are its catchwords. Our accomplishments along the path of reformist strategy, despite a relatively short period of time, are of similar importance. Suffice it to mention, in this regard, the various milestones underscored in matters of democratization, such as the October transparent and fair elections, which brought about a national constituent assembly in charge of drafting a new constitution and initiating the reform of institutions. We have likewise set up the various mechanisms that would entail the deep restructuring of the judiciary, the economic, as well as the media sectors. Our sole ambition is to lay the basis of a political pluralism that guarantees wide popular participation while enshrining in the present and future generation of Tunisian the respect of diversity, the conformity of the universal principle of human rights and the necessary pacific and harmonious coexistence. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Camp, it goes without saying that the difficulties which lie ahead are daunting and the road towards a genuine, balanced and equitable development is fraught with hardness and possible backlashes. Tunisia indeed evolves an international environment married by harsh competition and lingering economic hardships. Yet, our resolve is stronger than ever as we have actually succeeding, succeeded in doing away with the most ferocious autocracies that our modern world has ever witnessed, we will deploy every effort to succeed in our democratic transition and make out of the Tunisian revolution, which, which heralded the Arab awakening, a truly, truly positive, positive and inspiring, inspiring experience. experience. Excellencies, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, and Mr. Camp, Camp why I profoundly treasure the precious token of gratitude and generosity, I sincerely wish for the success to your outstanding organization for its tremendous work and the service of freedom and peace, and express the hope that our endeavors would be up to the expectations you are placing us and the recognition to which this auspicious ceremony is displayed. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Hedi Ben Abbas, Secretary of State to the Minister of Foreign Affairs in charge of the Americas and Asia to accept a word on behalf of President Marzouki and the people of Tunisia. Applause. Thank you all, Mr. President, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the President of Tunisia, His Excellency President Mohammed Mansouf Merzouki, and on behalf of the Tunisian people, I'd like to thank you from the bottom of my heart for this distinguished award granted to the President and to the people at this very special period of our history. I also feel very grateful to the efforts made in order to be recognition to the Tunisian people for the efforts they have made, for the achievements they also have made in order to gain their freedom. And they did pay a dear price for that. Now, it is up to the representatives of this great and courageous people to write a constitution. And in that constitution, we wish them to write and to engrave with golden letters the word freedom, which is a central word in our lives. Please, <laughs> please be assured that today in Tunisia, Democracy is a one-way road. There will be no returning back. 
Freedom once, freedom twice, freedom thrice. We'll breathe you when you wake up in the morning. We will embrace you all day long. We will feel your warmth when we go to sleep. And whatever may happen, we will always cherish you. Thank you so much. Thank you for that poetic acceptance. Ladies and gentlemen, it is uh, an enormous honor to welcome our next introducer to the stage, Polish Foreign Minister Radek Sikorski. Minister Sikorski, as we all know, has a lifetime of experience working for democracy and freedom. As Foreign Minister, he has led Poland with incredible ambition, launching the Eastern Partnership Initiative and pushing for the establishment of a European endowment for democracy. The Atlantic Council has been honored to host Minister Sikorski at our events in Washington, including our annual Bronisław Garamek Lecture, where he appeared with Senator John McCain, also a Freedom Awardee. Last year in Wrocław, he accepted the Freedom Award on behalf of the people of Poland and reminded us all, as he spoke of Poland's remarkable history and bright future, that, quote, ideas and values can be stronger than the chains of tyranny. Radek, my friend, this, this stage is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to human rights, the Honorable Emma Bonino, Vice President of the Italian Senate, is no armchair activist. Whether behind the erstwhile Iron Curtain, in Black Africa, the Arab world, Central Asia or the Far East, she always rolled up her sleeves and walked the walk. Arrests in Poland under martial law the communist Prague or the Taliban-ruled Afghanistan did not deter her. As a Pole, I'm particularly grateful to you that in the dreamy days of Western Europe's Ostpolitik, you reminded Italian politicians that the rights of the solidarity trade unions were not a, a triviality in the context of their business dealings with the Eastern Bloc. I'm glad that back then, when it took courage, as a member of the European Parliament, you mobilized your colleagues to stand up for the rights of conscientious objectors. And the collapse of communism, you were aware, did not bring about a universal triumph of democracy. Your strategic foresight is legendary. Appointed to become the EU Commissioner for Health, Consumer Protection and Humanitarian Affairs, Instead of heading straight to Brussels, Emma Bonino first went to Tuzla, just as the fires of Srebrenica were burning out. We are facing genocide, she correctly diagnosed, at a time when few had the audacity to call spade a spade. Soon she would start urging the international community to indict Milosevic. And partly thanks to her effort, he ended up at The Hague for good. Today, thanks to the International Criminal Court, which Emma Bonino helped to bring about, dictators who engage in genocide can no longer assume that their crimes will go unpunished. In 1997, Emma Bonino had Kalashnikov assault rifles pointed at her by the Taliban, who were not exactly thrilled by her Flyer for Women of Kabul campaign. Yet, in Kabul, she made the point that, point that the West is not an uninvolved bystander in the Afghan conflict and should bring political pressure to bear on the Taliban. Today, a colleague of hers in the Radical Party claims that perhaps we wouldn't have had 9-11 if we had listened to Emma Bonino and taken action. As a longtime friend of the Afghan people, I share the sentiment. I met Emma seven years ago in Washington. She was speaking 
at the institute I worked at the time, the American Enterprise Institute, about women as a revolutionary force in the Arab world, seven years ago. At that time, few would have thought that women, long disenfranchised, especially in the Arab world, could be a vanguard for change. But now, in the wake of Arab Spring, we are all in awe at the contribution that women like Ezra Abdel Fattah, honored at this forum last year, or Lina Ben Menni have brought to the struggle for reforms. Whether in Cuba, through the nonviolent resistance of the Dames in White, also celebrated here, or in Burma, thanks to the moral compass set by, by Aung San Suu Kyi, no one uh, anymore has the slightest doubt that women are a force of change. Emma, I wish most men were as effective as you are. I cannot do justice to your many accomplishments. I am glad that you have given such a strong backing to the Community of Democracies, which we launched in Warsaw in 2000. Democratic governance should, and indeed as you advocate, is a criterion for membership uh, in good standing at the United Nations. Sure. Like everybody in this, in this room, I know that just in the past, you will never tire of, of advocating democracy because, as you said, any achievement in human rights, and women, women's rights in particular, is not forever, and it, that has to be preserved and struggled for time and again. I am delighted to be able to present to you this Freedom Award. Please accept it. <laughs>
in very difficult circumstances and hostile environments, most of the time from your own friends. <laughs> huh. In many countries, mine for example, during these two days of debate, the issue of democracy being at risk in our society was at the center of our discussions. And in my country's exam, this is an issue of great concern. Democracy has been taken for granted for too long, as if democracy didn't need to be continuously nurtured and protected. So we are preaching democracy to the outside world. Sometimes we forget our own situation. On the contrary, I think, as we have witnessed in the fast changing world, fear of the unknown, uncertainty of the future, have opened the door to a wave of populism, intolerance, xenophobia, with a sweeping effect throughout the continent. Populism in particular is a disease that threatens the checks and balance of liberal democracy. And strengthening transatlantic leadership of global values is the council mission, and if so, finding a way on how to live together, combining freedom and diversity within the rule of law is our big challenge for the still young 21st century, a challenge to which we must respond in a more effective, and trailblazing way, <laughs> whether on this side or on the other side of the Atlantic. Right, I, I'm Italian by birth, by love, by culture. I'm a European by determination and by passion. I am a global citizen because human rights are no different from Siberia to South Africa, from Asia to Latin America. And I'm glad that I'm here today with you, with good friends, with Ana Palacio and President Brock. I saw we just spent two days exciting debating in Berlin inside the European Council of Foreign Relations exactly what to do. And I simply hope that whatever the complexity, people keep telling you, oh, the situation are very complex. Very complex, which is the departing point of doing almost nothing. <laughs> I've never seen in my life a simple situation, anyhow. But yes, behind the very complicated issue, there are very simple points. For instance, and I'm talking to my Arab friends and African friends, it's high time that you stop cutting your children. Right? Stop female genital mutilation. It has no sense, no value, it's just a torture. So in the meantime, we look for any kind of broad revolution, a simple, very simple point. I want a worldwide ban against female genital mutilation. Please join. Okay. Uh, Emma Benino, that uh, that was very inspiring. Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to welcome our next introducer. Uh, Maciej Vitutski. Let me just say two things quickly about Maciej Vitutski. Uh, first of all, uh, let me talk about him as an Atlantic Council, uh, perhaps one of our most dedicated and creative board members. Um, a good board member is someone who, behind the scenes and without embarrassing its president and CEO, tells him when he's getting things wrong. Uh, Maciej does do that. A great board member is a person who comes up with absolutely brilliant ideas and initiatives and never takes the credit and lets the president and CEO take the credit. Um, I really appreciate that side of you even more, Maciej. 
Um, the Wrocław Global Forum was one of our crazy brainstorm ideas uh, uh, where Maciej said there is this absolutely brilliant, innovative uh, mayor uh, in a city called Wrocław, and, and, um, and I think he may be really interested in brainstorming something really creative, global, uh, and, uh, and innovative. Um, and so that's where it all started. Maciej, as a business executive, is not just a business leader, chief executive of Polish Telecom. He's an innovator who understands that his influence can reach far beyond the boardroom. It was that mentality that inspired us here. Uh, so let me join, let me, uh, please join me in welcoming him to the stage uh, a role he doesn't always eagerly play, uh, but I think it's uh, time to take you from behind the scenes to here as an introducer this evening again. Thank you. Thank you, Fred, for this, as usual, too short and over-exaggerated introduction. So, ladies and gentlemen, we have seen those days how dangerous it is to follow this, the prompters, so I will, I will support myself with a piece of paper and to tell you how great pleasure and honor is to me to introduce Władysław Bartoszewski. It seldom happens that one person live tells the story of the whole century, of the 20th century. When Władysław Bartoszewski, here present, was 17, he was stretcher bearer during the German siege of Warsaw in 1939. When he was 21, he was a member of the Polish resistance and the member of the Polish Council to add Jews, Zegota. When the war ended and he confessed to having fight for the Polish Home Army, he was imprisoned by the communist regime for many years. When he was finally freed and rehabilitated with the help of the former member of Zegota, Zofia Rudniska, he was awarded the award of writers among the nations. When he was 35, he had been jailed for both, by both Nazis and communists for almost a decade. He would go on to dismiss this by saying, quite simply, the dictators didn't like me. The feeling was and is reciprocated. <laughs> he said it in 1995, when as a foreign minister, he was the first Pole to speak between the joint assemblies, in front of the joint assemblies of Bundestag and Bundesrat at the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the end of the Second World War. For many, this would be the autumn of the years. For Władysław Bartoszewski, it was not even the middle of his political career, which still continues. He went on to again become the foreign minister in, in Prime Minister Jerzy Buzek's government in 2000 and oversaw the key moment of the Polish-EU accession negotiations. If ever there was a person who symbolized the difficult history of the 20th century, it would be Władysław Bartoszewski. He has had the misfortune to have witnessed the tragedy and the atrocities of the Second World War and the bleak, bleak soundness of freedomless everyday life behind the Iron Curtain. At the same time, the same person was a pioneer of the Polish-German reconciliation and the Polish-Jewish friendship. He has been and still is bringing together nation and peoples despite their difficult histories. When I think of my youngest son and I want to tell him what hope is, I think that his life, but this wife's life, could be the best and the most beautiful example of that. Freedom Awards are given to extraordinary people who defended and advanced the cause of freedom around the world. This in itself is more than enough for one's, one's one lifetime. For Władysław Bartoszewski, it is just a fraction of what he has given to this land and to this people. Professor Bartoszewski has often underlined that he owes very much to the fact that he was born in a free Poland and schooled in the ethos of patriotism of, and the love of freedom. This education was put by test by two terrible totalitarian regimes of the 20th century. And his life, he has been graduating with honors. 
Ladies and gentlemen, please salute Władysław Bartoszewski. Ladies and gentlemen, when a few months ago uh, I was celebrating in a royal castle in Warsaw uh, my 90th uh, anniversary, I was told at 90 years you have a right to speak for nine minutes. Today I shan't apply the same principle and, and therefore I will speak a bit shorter perhaps uh, with less diplomacy at least, perhaps with less diplomacy than the Secretary of the State of the current Prime Minister. Because I am Władysław Bartoszewski, uh, jestem Catholic, the citizen of Europe, and similar as uh, my Italian colleague Emma Bonino, I'm also the citizen of the world. Because I am always on the side of persecuted and uh, punished and oppressed. It's not because I chose this particular road. No, uh, this road was chosen for me because I was 18 years old when I became one of the first few thousand, one of the first few thousand uh, prisoners of the Auschwitz concentration, concentration camp, which was created by Nazis uh, on Polish territory. I managed to survive uh, spring, uh, autumn, uh, winter and spring in the camp, and uh, as a result of the efforts of uh, Red Cross, uh, for uh, which I worked uh, before the war and they had no uh, materials against me, um, they were able to free me because they, there were no charges against me. I was only a schoolboy uh, before the war. Uh, and therefore I became a member of a group that was condemned for uh, being somebody and something uh, and persecuted. Uh, war changed everything and ruined my life because uh, I was a son of a bank clerk and I, I was expecting a prosperous and easy life and instead uh, the matter of freedom, uh, the, this, this uh, freedom became obsession to me and I started uh, acting in a group called Zagota, which was trying to defend Jewish uh, community prosecuted and condemned to death. Um, and uh, thanks to that activity, uh, uh, for the last 40 odd years, I'm one of the just among the uh, citizens of the world. Uh, and I've become an honorary uh, citizen of the state of Israel. And as far as I know, no country in the world had a foreign affairs uh, minister uh, who is at the same time honorary citizen uh, of the Israel. Um, in the scope of my work, it became uh, some kind of uh, benefit. And uh, suddenly, in my 90th year, um, ecumenical, supranational miracle happened. Uh, in the on the same day, I got simultaneously two letters from two eminent figures, the Pope Benedict XVI, who expressed in a very uh, 
gratifying and important way as uh, for me as a Catholic re expressing uh, respect to my efforts on the reconciliation between Polish, uh, Jewish and German nations. At the same time, I have a letter from Shimon Peres addressing me as dear Władysław. Can you tell me another politician in this world, another person in this world who can receive such two letters uh, on, on uh, uh, birthday? Uh, but it doesn't matter for me, it matters for Poland. The fact that I am here today is particularly moving to me because despite receiving several orders, medals and rewards for my efforts, uh, I can only say that among the most important uh, ones for me is the title of honorary citizen of the State of Israel because it is an expression of my efforts uh, for trying to save other people, even in the completely hopeless conditions. Uh, it, so it happened that in the last few weeks, uh, in 1942, Jan Karski spent his uh, time with me uh, and before he left Poland. And sometimes I think if he was able to look down on us because uh, for the last 12 years he's not with us anymore, what would he think about today's world? Uh, is it the world that is free of threats that he was challenged with uh, in his day? Uh, is it different to the time when he was taking out microfilms and, docu microfilms and documents which were meant to warn the world that uh, in the conditions of the organized hatred, uh, the crime happens and try to pr prevent further crime. And um, of course, in the conditions of conspiracy and fight for democracy in my country, and for 18 years after the war, I was the uh, conscious uh, but undercover uh, co collaborator with uh, Radio Free Europe, and I gained a very high opinion of my American allies, of uh, my colleagues from uh, Radio Free Europe. And here I will also add a literary anecdote because I'm also a journalist and a writer. I was a chairman of a pen club for several years. I can just remember that when Mr. Kozminski was a Polish ambassador in Washington and he had a great uh, achievement for the cause of contacts and uh, relations between Poland and the United States, I was really his boss and I uh, went to the States as a part of uh, official visits and the two of us were inv invited to the uh, headquarters of CIA, which uh, are located outside Washington. And uh, when we were arriving there, we saw, oh, look, God of Honor waiting for people below the position of the prime minister. And we met, obviously, uh, Mr. Studeman, who was the head of CIA at that time. And we got introduced. And I said, perhaps I say something about myself. No, he says, we know everything about you. Luckily, others didn't know everything about me. And thanks to that, for those 18 years, I was able to work for Radio Free Europe. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my fate, God, rewarded me in such a way for my efforts that I was able to uh, see the improvement in the, and the reconciliation between the Polish and German nation. And my speech in uh, German parliament, uh, I was able to make uh, unprecedented it, it was an unprecedented event. I was able to make a speech of 90 minutes to the na German nation. And next day, I, was, I wouldn't be a writer if I wasn't curious. Next day, I found out from the media that the German television noted a 20 million audience share uh, because there was a very high interest in my speech. In Poland, there was no such reflection. However, uh, there was a very strong response in other countries. And soon after, I was invited to the uh, Goethe Institute in Tokyo to share my experience in reconciliation with the enemy. I didn't know much about Japan at the time. However, I knew a lot about enemy, about contempt, about dehumanization. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, 
to follow in this uh, audience. Uh, I would like to mention some of my friends. Uh, among the dead is obviously Mr. Havel, among the living, Mr. Wawensa, Mr. Buzak, and some uh, supposedly insignificant people such as Adam, Adam Michnik or Hela Uceva. It is a great joy to me and great honor that I am uh, numbered among such people. Mm, and, uh, of course, uh, dear friends, may the enemies are not here and perhaps they are somewhere else. We don't have to be uh, friendly and be pleasant to them because uh, uh, love of the other human being doesn't have to uh, go that far. I think that we should raise once again this issue. There is no freedom without responsibility. There is no responsibility without respect for the dignity of every person, this, uh, never mind what religion, race or creed they belong to. There is no way for uh, group uh, qualification of people, qualifying them according to some key. You can do it with dogs. People from uh, any, do uh, any race, gender, age, uh, country, continent are the same and have equal rights. And I don't think we have such problems in this audience. However, I'm going to raise my voice and raise my voice again, as I always did, against xenophobia, anti-Semitism, uh, covered up as anti-Zionism, against racism. You shouldn't be this or the other. You should simply be a human being. I can just say, and this is the ending anecdote, in February 2011, I was on a business trip as a part of a government delegation uh, in Israel. And at some point, Mr. Netanyahu publicly kissed me uh, on, uh, uh, while we were on the stage. And then later on, I heard comments from German and American Jews, and you allowed Net Netanyahu to kiss you? Uh, well, am I supposed to still participate among, uh, in, in the conflicts uh, among people in one small country? Let's respect all the people, and let's try to like them. It is not always nice. Those people don't always make it easy for us. But those who like people live longer. It is a very practical uh, advice. <laughs>